is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Magician's Guild by Trudy Canavan. Brought to you by Ashley Dunleavy. In these first four chapters, this girl is being hunted by a bunch of spoiled brat, snobby ass, bitchy fucking magicians, and I hope that they never find her ever. I guess there's one decent guy in the bunch, but like mostly they're terrible. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. And again, thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Um, The Magician's Guild is one that I have been asked to cover before, but have always confused with the magicians, understandably. Um, And, you know, the magicians is one that I like kind of had on my somewhat front burner, but then things kind of have gotten out of hand with some other shows. So it's been pushed to the back burner. And when Ashley initially commissioned this, I was like, I'm not sure if I should accept this commission because I was thinking, and then I realized it was not the thing that I thought it was. So, um, I began reading and, uh, I'm just, again, so grateful that my listeners all have such excellent taste because this is yet again a really good gripping story already. Um, So again, thank you, Ashley. Um, So, all right, let's start from the beginning on this one. The... I'm going to give an overview here, which is a little easier to do with this book than it has been with some others, because with some like Fire and Hemlock, which I just recorded on, um, the story really unfolds as you're reading and you're not sure where it's going or what the uh, what you're supposed to be like paying attention to at the time. Um, And this is something that I feel like has a much clearer groundwork and kind of uh, mythology to the world. And there's a clearer objective, like right out of the gate. So I covered chapter, um, I read chapters one through four, the purge, the magicians debate, old friends and the search continues. So the purge is (laughs) not what it sounds like, because we all know that movie. Um, I have thankfully never seen it and never plan to. But The Purge is basically a ritual uh, once a year that is meant to drive out all of the poor from, like, what's essentially tenement housing, like ghettos, you know? It's um, tons of people living together in really squalid conditions, according to the king who decided on having this Purge in the first place, and... um, he lets it build up for a year and then has everybody driven out and the place is like sometimes just burned down, I guess. Um, it's not entirely clear yet. We just get like a cursory uh, history lesson. But that's what's in like, this is what's happening as the story begins is that this purge is happening and all of these people who are poor and really have nothing are filing out in the streets basically with no place to go and hoping that they're going to be able to find somewhere to sleep tonight. Meanwhile, there's a lot of, uh, you know, more wealthy folks up in the third, fourth stories of the buildings looking down on the street and looking down on the people in every sense of the word. And there's a couple of really nice moments. The, The main character... Um, Sunia, I believe is how you want to say her name. Um, she is like really considering just throwing a brick through their window of this, these people that are like sneering at her and her friends. And, uh, I kind of like the fact that this is clearly like something that she may have done. Um, except that she couldn't find a rock because it's winter the snow has melted. There's just like sludge and mud everywhere and she can't find a rock. But if she had been able to, I kind of think that she might've done it maybe. Um, 
it's at least not something that's an idle thought to her. Like, it's an interesting setup here because, you know, the impression that you get from this these first few pages of everybody who's poor filing out and there are guards everywhere. And I was thinking that everything would be a lot stricter than it is, that if people didn't follow orders immediately or if they didn't, like, behave in an incredibly respectful way, that they'd be, like, knocked down by guards or beaten or whatever. It's not exactly at that stage. It's incredibly inhumane to just like turn people out onto the streets and be like, figure it out. Um, but it hasn't reached the kind of level where these people are being constantly chaperoned is not the word that I want managed watched. They're being watched, but it's not, there was a certain, certain like militarism that I expected. And that isn't really how it is at the moment. Um, so she's like trying to, you know, find, meet up with her family because she is with an aunt and uncle, I believe, who are taking care of her. And um, she gets sidelined because she hears a couple of the guards talking about trying to catch someone. And if anybody in the audience has the names of some of these characters that I have not yet started to learn, it'd be super helpful. Um, but one of them is a dude who is an old friend of hers that she knew from like being a kid. And they mention him by name and talk about how like one of the people that they work with, a fellow guard got nailed by this guy and wasn't able to like get rid of the rash, which I'm realizing that phrasing that I just used now is really, really unfortunate, but it's not what it sounds like. Um, Essentially, there's obviously somebody who's like out there causing trouble for some of these guards. And we find out later that it's like packets of this powder that when you throw them, they like burst. And it's basically like itching powder. It's not something that's genuinely dangerous, but it's extremely irritating and annoying to be on the receiving end of it. And uh, it's, you know, just sort of a way of showing defiance without really causing any serious harm, which I think is really an interesting con like this is always the question right like how is is a show of defiance that we all know to be purely ceremonial and symbolic really worth anything i tend to think it is um but it it there's a point where you've got to do more than that if things continue on as they are um, however, it should be noted that everybody who like winds up as part of this later on is really young. So they're kind of, you know, I, it's the sort of thing where, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So she just, she hears them talking about this person that she used to know that they're going to try and um, catch him, that they've like set up a trap because they, he's been irritating them and some of their friends. And she decides to double back and see if she can find the guy and warn him, or at least um, if she can find somebody that he used to know. And there is a moment with like a hand signal that she signals somebody that's like standing on one of the stoops and he signals her back and then comes and talks to her. And is like that hand signal you just use is really old. So we get the impression immediately that while she may know these people in general, like the concept of who they are and might have been involved with them at one time and might know the person that the guards are attempting to catch, she's not part of this world anymore, really. And it's something that she may have been saddened by like a couple years ago, but she's grown up just enough at this point that she's kind of like glad to not be part of it anymore. And I sort of found that to be a, like a nice point to start the story where rather than like wanting, she's not somebody who's looking in from the outside going, oh, I really wish that I could be one of you. It's, I was one of you and I'm not anymore. And frankly, I'm kind of glad because that was really exhausting. Didn't accomplish a ton. And my life is slightly better now that I'm not. Um, which, you know, that's a valid situation. Um, so this guy is about to bring her to um, see the friend that she is wanting to warn. And they get caught up in the middle of a little tussle with some guards where they're throwing those packets, they're throwing rocks. And 
all of a sudden out of a doorway comes somebody in this like long cloak slash robe and everybody shouts magician and they all like flee. Um, so we're talking about like, you know, I like to, when I bring up a brand new book, pardon me for all the noise. I'm trying to roll my chair closer to my desk. Um, I like to talk about like what I expected just based on like the title, the cover, if I know anything about this author or if I've heard anything about it, um, magicians as law enforcement officers is not what I was expecting. And that's essentially what they are in this is they're working for the king and help enforcing the purge, which sucks. Dislike. Don't want magicians who are traditionally in my eyes pretty cool and, you know, Sometimes there are evil ones, but there's also good ones. And I don't like them being on the side of somebody who's down with the purge. And we find out like a little bit later when we get into the POV of one of the magicians that they don't even necessarily understand the depths of what they're doing. And those who do understand are like so without empathy that it almost still counts as not understanding. Um, but I'm probably giving them far more lenience on that than they deserve. So they get caught up in this, in this thing because everybody flees as soon as they hear that there's a magician. And then there's like a line of magicians that stands at this certain area in the square. And it's like tradition that the magicians put up a shield and everybody who's irritated and wants to make a show of standing up for themselves comes forward with various things to throw and throws them at the shield, even though it won't hit the magicians. It's not going to go through. It's just like, you know, it's meant to make themselves feel better. And the magicians let them do it to blow off steam because they know that it's smart. Um, but they don't even like put very much thought into the shield anymore. Like it's a really low level thing as we find out later. And they're in the middle of throwing things. And, and this is the part that kind of, um, got to me a little bit is that Sunia is like walking through the crowd with the other folks who are heading forward to throw things. And she has to be kind of uh, convinced to join in. Um, because, like I said, she really isn't part of this world anymore. But she's walking forward through this crowd. And all of these older people are like pressing things into her hands to throw rocks, fruit, you know, all of this stuff that these are people that they should be the ones taking up for the younger kids and really doing something because the younger kids are not yet old enough to understand how much when they are older, they're going to wish they really did something. They're going to wish that they had, it was more than just a show of defiance, that there was real defiance behind it, that they were doing something. But the older people, instead of like taking any responsibility in the scene are just handing over like missiles for the young kids to do this, like po ultimately pointless thing in order to make themselves feel a little bit better for a few minutes. And it's really like frustrating to read, you know, they watch these rocks hit this uh, shield and do nothing or the packets of powder hit the shield and explode and do nothing and cheer and are very like delighted by this, even though it's just not doing anything except giving them a little bit of a temporary like burst of adrenaline. Um, so what winds up spurring Sunia on to do something that she has apparently never done before um, she is watching this whole display with the throwing of the packets and everything else. And one of the guys in the crowd in, or one of the magicians, um, it's all men, by the way, that are standing there. And this led me to think it, initially that all the magicians are men. Turns out that is not the case, but that most female magicians become healers, which, all right, I guess, whatever. But, um, one of them like whispers to the other about how this like, uh, can we go inside this disgusting pack of animals like stinks or he just says something really snotty and disrespectful. And she loses her temper and throws the rock and does so thinking to herself as she throws it. I really fucking hope this goes through. I want it to go through and I want it to hit you right in your goddamn head. And 
it does. <laughs> Spoiler alert. There's a flash of blue light. Rock sails right clear through that fucking that shield. Hits the guy in the head. He goes down. And long story short, this is what we call an overreaction. Because all of the magicians are looking around trying to figure out who threw it, who could possibly have gotten through the shield. One guy spotted her standing and looking at her hands in disbelief, realizing what she did. And he knows that it was her. And they're going, who did it? Who did it? He points to her. And everybody thinks that he's pointing to the dude standing next to her. Unfortunately for that guy. And they all essentially hit him with stunning spells. It's like, got another name, but that's basically what it is. I'm going to use some Harry Potter verbiage sometimes in here. And it has the effect of like, you know, three or four stunning spells in a row hitting Minerva McGonagall on the chest, for example. Uh, except way worse, he bursts into flames and dies. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I shouldn't laugh, but like, that was unexpected. Uh, it was unexpected to everybody. It was unexpected to her because she like, basically she tries to run and blend in with the crowd, hoping that nobody knows it was her. She sees that one of the magicians is staring her dead in the eyes and knows that he knows, but then thinks maybe she can just escape and then gets like tripped up and there's a smell of burning and she looks up and there's some dude laying on the ground next to her engulfed in flames, like already dead. So, yeah, she wasn't expecting that. Um, the magicians had not intended that. Like, nobody had... The, the, somebody doing magic, we find out later, without, like, being sanctioned, without being part of the guild or being properly trained, it's it's not a totally unheard of thing by any means. It's unusual, but it's something that happens. But they're not supposed to respond in this manner. And the fact that they all reacted with the same spell at the same time to sort of stun whoever did it is pretty irresponsible and just like shows how their heads are not in the game at the moment. Like they're all just reacting without communicating with each other. And um, so it winds up with somebody dead and this winds up being kind of a factor in how they decide to proceed later on. And of course, it winds up being a factor for Sunia, who feels that if they catch her, they will kill her because they clearly are fine with killing. And it, to her, it seems as if they killed somebody because they thought they were her, that they had done what she... So the whole thing is... Um, <laughs> it's just a lot of like miscommunication and sloppiness to be honest. And uh, it definitely like, you know, brings to mind um, some po police brutality situations and protests and things that have been happening lately with just complete overreactions that are so out of proportion to what's actually going on. And then being like, well, why didn't you comply? Well, maybe because I thought you were going to kill me because you love doing that. You kill a lot. Just FYI. Um, so yeah, she winds up getting away, but her friend who was helping her, who like convinced her to come and uh, throw rocks in the first place, um, Heron is the guy. There we go. Um, Heron, he stops her and that's the end of the chapter with her. But we wind up finding out later that like he kind of knows what just happened and he asks her for confirmation, but it's like people can tell from the way that she's reacting to everything that it was her and that she did magic somehow and they help her to hide because of course they think that she's going to be killed um this is absolutely what i would also think if i were her or if i were them so let's go to the actual guild shall we we start off this next chapter the magician's debate from the perspective of lord rothen Lord Rothen is the more empathetic um, of all of the magicians that we meet. There's another one named uh, Daniel, I think his name is. Um, and he's better. Yeah, Daniel um, or Daniil, whatever. Uh, 
I'm not going to go through the many pronunciations. But Daniil is like a little bit still very self-important, the same way that many of the others seem to be. It's just that he's a little bit more, I want to say in a lot of ways, he's just more practical and thinks outside of the box a little bit more. Rothen is less practical and more emotional. Um, And I mean that in a good way. Like he is moved a couple of different times by things that other people don't seem to care about or don't seem to understand the implications of. So the whole deal here is, uh, first of all, them dealing with the fact that y'all killed somebody in the street and everybody saw you. So not only did you kill an innocent person like a bunch of fucking noobs, but you made us look really bad and now our reputation is going to be fucked and they already hate us and now they think that we're a bunch of murderers and good fucking job ruining our reps just a little bit more. And there's this moment, um, I'm finding this this point where the... Uh, the guild is trying to decide how they're going to deal with the situation. Um, this raises difficult questions, Lorlin said. It is unlikely that the public will believe us if we tell them we simply made a mistake. An apology is not enough. We must make some attempt at reparation. Shall we compensate the family of the youth? Several of the higher magicians nodded, and Rothen heard murmurs of approval behind him. If they can be found, one of the higher magicians added, I fear compensation will not repair the damage we have done to our reputation, Lorlin frowned. How can we regain the respect and trust of the people? Murmuring followed, then a voice called out, Compensation is enough. Give it time, people will forget, said another. We've done all we can. And quieter to Rothen's right. Just a slum boy, who cares? Rothen sighed. Though the words did not surprise him, they roused in him a familiar anger. The guild existed by law to protect others, and that law made no distinction between rich and poor. He had heard magicians claim that slum dwellers were all thieves and didn't deserve the guild's protection. So, there's no way to read that without drawing a parallel to what's going on with police brutality in America today and the fact that the best thing that parents who lose children can hope for is to sue the city and get a settlement from like the police department, which is a real cold comfort because one, your beloved family member is still fucking dead Two, the person who killed them still probably has a fucking job. Three, the people paying for that settlement are often taxpayers because it's coming from the police department And four, justice, why is there never any question mark? Like, legit, this is so, so familiar. And the idea of, well, who cares? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Who cares? Apparently nobody. (sighs) It's so depressing, you guys. So... At least we have fucking uh, Rothen being like somebody who gives a shit. Um, Daniel is like, he cares, but it's more, he's much more detached from the whole thing. Like he sees it for what it is, which I can at least say is more than the other magicians do. The other magicians don't understand, don't want to understand this, this like, impoverished situation that most of the folk are living in the dwells as they call them. Um, and they just don't have an appreciation for how bad the conditions are and what people are facing. Daniel seems to understand all of that, but he has a much more like, well, what can you do? Poverty exists kind of attitude and doesn't seem like intent in any way on improving that for anybody. Rothen has not yet taken action to improve it for anyone, but I have a feeling he's going to try because we see in the coming chapters how 
shielded from all of this he has been and how much of a complete shock it is for him to go out into the outer circle and see the conditions that people are living in. And it's just more than he was prepared for. And I don't know if any of you have ever like lived abroad and visited areas where there are, is really, really like a kind of poverty that you've never seen. Or even if you've seen that kind of poverty in American neighborhoods that like, I feel like it's much more likely, honestly, for a lot of Americans to see that kind of poverty abroad than at home. Because at home, there are areas that you just have been told your whole life to stay away from. So if you live near it, you often don't see it because you do your best to avoid seeing it because you know where to avoid looking. But if you go abroad, you're not familiar and you just wind up stumbling on these areas and you're just shocked by it. Um, So when I say if you've lived abroad, I'm not at all implying that that kind of poverty doesn't exist in the United States because boy, howdy does it. it. It's much worse than it even used to be. Um, but it's just the sort of thing that I feel like we've got, we've been very skilled at, at shielding ourselves from. So, but anyway, yeah, Rothen just really had no idea how bad it was for a lot of people. And there's some guilt there for him. And I think he's going to start questioning like this yearly purge that they all do with no thought. Evidently, the fact that they do this purge, and this is the first time they've ever visited any of the areas that they're purging, like really, is really i mean it's not shocking in in that that behavior is is not shocking to me anymore unfortunately it's more it's so irresponsible like i think that's really what it is is that it comes down to how can you agree to do this kind of work and not educate yourself in exactly what that means before you do it how fucking like shameless is that Really, it's just super irresponsible and frankly, just dangerous. Um, And I can't imagine that he's the only one that feels that way, but he's the only one that we've seen by the time I finish the fourth chapter. Um, So there are three people who are like on the, um, it's basically like the Supreme Court of the uh, Magician's Guild. And there is a woman named Vinara There is um, a dude named Balkan and there's another guy and I'm trying to see what his name is, uh, Jarek. And apparently Balkan is somewhat strict, um, but he can be open-minded. Jarek is pretty strict and and while he can like see that people might have a point, he really sticks to his guns. And then there is um, Venara, who is, I imagine, to be like more of a McGonagall type where she is, she has compassion, but she is also incredibly practical and tries to take like the path of least resistance for certain things. Um, So they discuss like, it's a, it's a kind of a fascinating concept here, actually, because this girl being out there slinging magic and not knowing what she's doing at all has not occurred to them. The first thing that they all think is that she's a rogue magician, that somebody is teaching her and that she is just standing in defiance of them, which is not the case at all, as we know. Then there's like, they bring up, well, what if she just didn't know what she was doing? And their argument there is how could she not know what she was like? She threw something and it went through the shit. Like you need to have an intent in order for magic to work that way. She can't be totally inexperienced and have still managed something like that. And Rothen, who saw um, Sonara, I already forgot her name, Sania, um, staring at her hands, is aware that like, no, I'm pretty sure that is what happened. But nobody really wants to hear that because it's so out. It's it's simultaneously it's outlandish and it's very dangerous. Like that's kind of worst case scenario is somebody out there with that kind of power who has absolutely no knowledge of it or control over it. That's a bad scene. And they all agree 
that if they find her and they realize that's what the scenario is, that at the very least for her protection, they're going to need to bring her in so that they can teach her control because otherwise she's like a straight up threat to the city, which is, you know, I mean, I could see somebody with the kind of power that she has, especially if she has like, if she has moments of extreme emotion, if she loses her temper, if she gets upset about something that that could cause some problems potentially. Um, so they have to kind of work blind here. Not exactly sure if uh, she has any training or not. And there's also this thing which they are, they talk about somebody has to have like opened her magic for her and released it for her. And that this is another thing that I think it's uh, Rothen who argues about it because evidently the training of magicians depends on, first of all, money, being able to afford good tutors. But second of all, if you have the magical ability in you, somebody ha- like your tutor has to release it within you. So if you're taught from a young age, you get tutored in how to like do certain things and like the the concept and the theory behind certain magic before they actually release the magic that is inside of you. Somehow they are able to bind it in the meantime. Um, and they have done it this way for so long that they have started to believe that's the only way that it works. And Rothen has to remind them, like, no, we've seen people with magical ability that started to come out as they became adults that was never bound by anybody or released by anybody. Like, this can happen. And it's kind of a startling moment because so many of them look like they're, like, ready to argue with him and sort of realize, like, oh, yeah, I guess that has happened. But again, this is sort of worst case scenario. If this is the case with this girl, then she's got no control over anything and just has magic that right out of the gate is strong enough to penetrate a shield, which is pretty impressive for like her first time accidentally doing magic. So it comes down to a combination of like this being probably a special circumstance and it being something that nobody really wants to believe is happening because it's a really inconvenient thing to deal with at the moment. Um, so, Yeah, there's just like this, uh, I found it really interesting, personally, this like, argument about what to do with her. Um, If they find her, if should we make her one of us and Vinara being a woman, really likes the idea of having another woman who's potentially very powerful as part of the guild. Um, But other people who are... God, classist doesn't even seem to really cover it. Um, But I'll use the word classist. Uh, Saren is saying, strength is no blessing if a magician proves corrupt. She could be a thief or even a whore. What influence would someone with that background have on the other novices? How can we know if she would value our pledge? Venara's brows rose. So you would show her what she is capable of, then bind her powers and send her back into poverty? Saren nodded. Vinara looked at Balkan, who shrugged. Biting back a protest, Rothen forced himself to remain silent. From the row above, Lorlin regarded the three magicians silently, his expression betraying no opinion. We should give her a chance at the very least, Venera said. If there is any possibility that she will conform to our rules and become a responsible young woman, then we should offer her the opportunity. The further her powers develop, the harder it will be to bind them, Saren reminded her. I know, Venera leaned forward, but it is not impossible. Consider how we will be regarded if we take her in. A little generosity and kindness will go a lot further toward redressing the damage we did to our reputation this morning than blocking her powers and returning her to the slums. Balkan's brows rose. True, and it may save us the trouble of a search if we make it known that she will be welcomed among us. Once she learns that she could become a magician, with all the position and wealth that entails, she will come to us. Um, so I really liked the way this conversation went where they're, they're not such a cold hearted group of people that, oh, well, we killed somebody, whatever, who cares? Everybody can just get over it. Like 
there's still enough of a need for diplomacy with the people in this situation that they have to worry about repairing that damage. So it's it's just not kind of the fascism, I guess, that I expected from the way the book starts. Um, and also the fact that they, you know, they're is a certain like, do we let her in? And what does that mean for us? And is she worthy of being part of this? And the worthiness is purely class based. That's what they're going off of. Like, if she was a whore, if she was a thief, if she did anything that we assume that we see as unfit, that makes her overall unfit to do what we do, despite the fact that she had no other options for staying alive. But that doesn't seem to occur to anybody. Nobody's worried about that. Like, Venera is being, I think, very diplomatic when she really kind of wants to be like, you don't know this bitch. Give her a fucking chance. They're all ready to just basically be like, if we find her and it turns out that she, like, is employed in a way we don't approve of, then we're just going to basically steal her magic from her and then throw her back out there with no which is just a horrific thing to do. Like that's a really fucked up option that they even have. The idea of her knowing that she might like taking her in, her getting to see what she is potentially capable of and then being bound and put back out there in that situation. I mean, it's like somebody who's poor finding out that they have this amazing inheritance that they didn't know about. And then somebody being like, actually, you're really not going to be responsible enough to deal with this. So we're just gonna and they just empty the account, you know. Um, so yeah, I just I, I really enjoyed this uh, conversation. And, you know, the very real fact of, obviously, the magicians have it pretty good. They live in luxury. And that she might just be convinced by that to become like part of them and behave properly, which uh, I'm sure has worked a time or two in the past, but there probably haven't been that many instances of that to really like, you know, use as a, a measuring gauge because Apparently, almost everybody who is part of the guild is also somebody who is from one of the noble houses. Um, they tend to try and find magic in noble families and foster it from those houses because those people will pay. So it there is a lot of potential that she's not the only like rogue wizard out there. You know, she could be the strongest that it really like came through for her this way. But there might be others that are just undiscovered because nobody is going into the slums and, and testing people and finding out if they have any sort of ability because they either assume they don't, it's probably a combo. Like you can assume they don't have this ability because only nobles have it. And you know, that's not really true, but you figure it's more likely to be true, which is that subtle kind of like classism that also in our universe bleeds over into racism, where it's like, well, maybe more white people are successful because they just work harder. And it's like, do you not hear yourself? What do you what are you saying? Exactly. Stop and think about it. Um, or they just don't want as many of the poor to be as good at it because it in their eyes devalues what they do and that would cause them to have to consort with poor and nobody wants to deal with the poors. Am I right? Listen, I don't want to deal with myself. So it's not like I don't feel you magicians. All right. It's no fun. I'm not going to lie to you, but holy shit, you guys suck. They're the worst. Um, so that what that whole meeting winds up concluding with them agreeing to um do a full scale search and assess her uh temperament and decide what to do with her once they find her and there is a suggestion from Daniel um that they go in as a like an, in disguise essentially and try and win the confidence of some of the dwellers um, 
in order to find her more easily because if they go around in their magician's uniforms, nobody's going to want to say shit to them because they are the enemy. And essentially, the only reason that they disagree with doing this is the indignity of it. Like his his plan is by far the more practical one. And it's probably from what we wind up seeing of her and her companions, they don't trust the magician. Of course they don't. They are seen as like boogeymen in a way. So doing it this way, like we can tell would be the better way to handle things. But the magicians like can't even bring like get over their ego enough to face that as an option. And it's really, frankly, pretty sad and they need to get over it, but they won't. Um, so, um, then we go back, we go to, um, chapter three, old friends and Sunia is asleep, um, waking up in a strange place and she is with Heron, um, another boy whose name I don't remember. And, uh, and Heron's girlfriend, whose father like owns the place, um, And so I guess it's like a tavern slash inn because it's a guest room that they're in. Um, Donia. That's right. Her name is Donia. Um, And Donia and Heron are involved. And I'm not entirely sure if Sonia is into Heron and is like a little jealous of Donia or if it's just that she's surprised by the fact that he's involved with anyone or what, but there's like just a, the barest flicker of like interest and curiosity on Sania's part when she sees the way that Heron and Donia interact with each other. Um, so they agree to, they like talk to her about her magic. She initially tries to deny that that's even what's happening. Um, which, you know, we find out that it's not really supposed to be allowed. And so it's understandable that she doesn't want to admit it. Um, but at the same time, she's sort of like, well, I'd really like it if this was not what happened. And if they just like messed something up with their shield and it was an accident. Um, but they're all like, well, don't, doesn't your uncle like have a health problem? You could maybe fix that. Like, there's a lot you could do. Why wouldn't you want? And she starts to reconsider and realize like, you know, what? I guess I'm only thinking about this in the context of I could get arrested. I could get killed. They fried a guy that was standing right next to me. But if I managed to pull this off and stay secret about it and they didn't know, there's a lot I could do. It's just the matter of being able to stay secret and be- teach myself how to do this kind of thing. Um, and I like this, this moment a lot. Um, they're t- because she's talking to, you know, they're the first thing they all ask her is like, well, what wouldn't you want to become a magician? And she's her immediate reaction is not like, yeah, it'd be pretty sweet. They seem to have a pretty easy lives or they have money and I'd be able to take care of my family or anything else. It's why would I want to do that? Everybody hates magicians, which is a pretty interesting, like, she'd be becoming part of this like faceless mob of bad oppressive people um which i feel like is really telling about who she is and how she thinks and i don't know i just i she says they they say something to her um about how nobody would give her any rub, like nobody would give her a hard time on the street and stuff if she were a magician. And she's like, are you kidding me? They would give me more. Um, And Sari says, everyone hates guild magicians. They're all from the houses. They only care about themselves. Everyone knows you're a dwell just like us. A dwell. After two years in the city, her aunt and uncle had stopped referring to themselves by the terms the slum dwellers gave themselves. They had made it out of the slums. They had called themselves crafters instead. The dwells would love having their own magician, Sari persisted, especially when you start doing good things for them. Sania shook her head. Good things? Magicians never do anything good. Why would the dwells think I'd be any different? What about healing, he said. Doesn't Ranel have a bad leg? You could fix it. So this is the first time that she's like, well, shit, maybe. Um, And then she says, people don't trust Curies. Why would they trust me? 
That's because people think the Curies make them sick as much as they make them well. They're scared they'll get sicker. They're scared of magic even more. They think I might have been sent by the magicians to get rid of them. Sarian laughed. Now that's silly. Nobody will think that. What about Burl? He made a face. Burl's a dunghead. Not everyone thinks like him. Um, so, you know, again, a really interesting, honest feeling back and forth that sounds like a conversation that people would actually have. Writing good dialogue. I've always found it to be like something that I'm able to do in a pretty simple way, but it can be done really, really badly. Um, and there's definitely been dialogue that I've gone back and read that I've written that I'm like, what are you doing? Um, but there's nothing more frustrating than the kind of conversation where people don't ask the questions that you might not think that they should be asking in the moment, because I'm not familiar enough with this world and the way that the attitudes are in their neighborhoods to know how people would react. So I don't know what questions to ask. But the way that this conversation unfolds, it's the kind of questions that if you finish the book and went back and started over, that you would be like, she should have been asking this at this point. Why didn't she ask this? So I really like that, that it's a combination of um, giving us some world building throughout through the conversation and like a bit of info dumping about the attitudes that people have. And also showing us that the characters take everything into account when they make decisions like this and have these kinds of conversations so that they're, you know, they're thinking things through, which is a nice bit of uh, character information to have. Um, so they wind up hiding. Um, they go down into these tunnels that are called the Thieves Road. Um, and it's basically like the sewer system under the road. And they are thinking that they're safe down there. But it turns out that the magicians are very aware of the thieves road and they are hoping that if they go down there and like fuck shit up for people enough that maybe somebody will like give themselves away in order to just get the magicians out of the tunnels because they hide a lot of like contraband and stuff down there. And they wind up in the tunnels with her and Heron and Ania um, and I think there's another person, uh, Seer, what's his name? He, they all are down there. Um, and the magicians start to come towards them and there's like a hidden room. There's tons of hidden passageways, hidden doorways and whatnot down here. They duck into this like side kind of closet. They barely can fit in there. And as he's passing by, um, Rothen is like aware of her, like he can feel her somehow, but he doesn't know how he can be feeling her when there's nothing there but a blank wall. And she can see him through the little crack staring straight the fuck at her. And so she starts to do the, this thing with, I am nothing. You cannot see me. I'm not even here. Nobody can see me. And all of a sudden she feels something come over her. And when she opens her eyes, he has moved on and she can't see him anymore. And it's obvious that she did something somehow to cloak herself from him, make herself invisible. Who knows? It wasn't even invisibility because he wasn't looking at her. He couldn't see her. He could sense her. So she did something to keep like whatever it was that was drawing her to her aura or something dampened down. I think later on they call it a presence. Um, so... Yeah, that's an, that's the second time that she has used her ability. Um, Daniel, meanwhile, is, uh, you know, wandering around trying to get information. Not trying too hard, I don't get the impression, because he generally seems to think that the way that they're doing this is really foolish. Um, and there's an interesting moment where he's, like, passing. Um, the people standing beside it shrank away. With an effort, he made himself take a deep breath and school his expression. He did not like to frighten people. Impress them? Yes. Inspire awe? Even better. But not terrify. It disturbed him how these people always shied off the road when he approached, then stared at him as he passed. The children were bolder, following him around, but quick to run away if he looked at them. Men and women, old and young, regarded him warily. All looked hard and cunning. 
he wondered how many worked for the thieves. And this is when he gets his idea that if they're using the thieves road to hide, which is certainly possible, that the thieves may know where she is. And the thieves and the guild have been enemies forever, understandably. But he's thinking that maybe they can get in touch with somebody who will be willing to work with them. And, you know, come to some sort of arrangement. Um, so this is something he sends off because he has a couple of guards that are sort of like having his back. Um, and he sends off a couple of them to get in touch with thieves and s present this like opportunity to them. It doesn't go great. The guards get robbed and beaten up and just left and they're not like, you know, going to die or anything, but they've been ceremoniously told no in no uncertain terms. And um, Daniel is a little disappointed and thinks that he's going to drop the whole thing. But Rothen, who wasn't really supposed to like know about this whole idea that Daniel had, um, thinks that, well, you know, there are other there's not just one band of thieves out there. They're not all run by like one person. You potentially have somebody else that could work with you. We might just need to try harder. And then eventually comes this idea that I think it's Rothen that has um, that they should offer a reward for somebody to help them find her. And it's kind of a so Fergan is the name of the magician who got hit in the head. The one who said the really snotty, terrible thing. Um, Fergan is one of those guys who just, he's not only a, a classist snob, but he's also just stays doing too much. Um, he is over here talking about how, yeah, giving them a reward would be a good idea. And we should also find them if they stand in our way, which like, how do you quantify that, Fergan? What does that even mean? Find them if... They First of all, blood from a stone, my friend. These are fucking poor people. They do not have the money for a fine. Find them all you want. You're not going to get anything. Like, mm. Second of all, standing in your way, what does that mean? There's no... Like, you need to... You need to stop is what you need to do. You need to sit down. And I really appreciate that Rothen has to be like, all right, buddy, you know what? And like kind of calm him down and just says, I think the compensation should be plenty. Um, so, yeah, that I felt like that moment with Fergan really tell like, not that we didn't know plenty from his comments that got him knocked upside the head with a rock. We got who he was in that moment. But I felt like that escalation of the suggestion to something that's frankly despicable is really telling. Um, so, yeah, that's like basically what's going on. Like the only thing that happens after that conversation is Sunia, uh trying to die or trying to color her hair because she has very dark hair. Um, and they cut it enough that she looks like more of a boy. She already looked like a boy a bit for, but they cut it off more and they're hoping that, you know, if these guys are looking for her, a young woman that people will think she's a boy and leave her alone. Um, and she mentions that she cut her hair off in many ways to keep men from hassling her and thinking that she was a woman in the first place. Um, so yeah, that seems like an unfortunate thing to have to do, but seems honest as well. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's about everything. I'm almost out of time here. Um, but it was a lot, you know, in these first four chapters. I'm just really like, um, I'm curious because I figure there has to be a point at which the magicians find her. Like, Rothen is, is the one that I hope finds her, of course, because he's the reasonable one. But I feel like it's just a matter of time. There's no way that this whole book is her hiding. And I don't know what that looks like. Um, and of, of course, her power must be pretty damn good because she's been able to do two very specific intentional spells and that's it's not like just bursts of magic that just come you know it happens because she willed it to happen so homegirl's got some power is all i'm saying 
Uh, I see there's a couple people in the chat here on Crowdcast, and I just want to double check if you guys have any questions for me before I wrap this sucker up. Again, thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Um, and yeah, she had said that she didn't want to commission any more until she knew if I liked it. Well, I like it, Ashley. Good on you. Excellent choice. Um, and I will leave a uh, link in the show notes for this so that if you guys want to pick up the book, you can do that. And thank you all so much. Make sure to, uh, if you would like to commission an episode, go to unspoiledpodcast.com slash shop. And um, also you can join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash spoil me pod. And uh, yeah, everyone, I hope to see you again soon. In about 15 minutes, I'm going to be doing the next Iron Druid installment. And um, yeah, after that, I don't think I have anything until next week. So if anybody wants to commission some stuff next week, get on it. Thanks, everybody, again. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.